So, uh, yeah. Happy yeah, Thanksgiving. Late, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Kind of. For, yeah uh, Thanksgiving Eve. Yeah, it's pretty much there. We're there. Welcome to Over 50, starting over. I'm Barry Edwards. And I'm Merle Garrison. Yeah, there's yeah. all kinds of preparations going on right oh. now. People are running to the store and getting, you know, if you're smart, you've got a list of things that you're going to make for Thanksgiving, and you're making some of it today so that you don't get overwhelmed tomorrow. So we got that going on over here. Yeah, we have for the last two days. Lisa's got a whole schedule to uh, to accomplish her, her lofty goals. And yeah, I got it. So does Anne Marie. This is okay. That's a whole subject in itself, right there. Is oh, it is. Men and women handle Thanksgiving because <laughs> my way is way different than Anne Marie's way. It's kind of like Chris, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's just a mess <laughs> from the male point of view. But I wanted to tell you, buddy, that uh, shortly after we got done with the podcast on Friday, we got news from my mom that we canceled Thanksgiving. The oh. family. Uh, that's and, what you're, what are you gonna do? Um, yeah, so Lisa and I were very bummed. It's our favorite holiday. And mine too. Yeah, the holidays in general, it, it's what I, I mentioned before somebody that deals with that seasonal affective disorder doesn't really bother me till January 1st because yeah, you got the holidays, you know? Right. Well, now all we got is a whole bunch of dark, cold days ahead of us. Uh, because you know, Christmas, you know, four weeks, Christmas, it's not going to be any different. No, you know, it's, it's here. Yeah. So Lisa and I were very, very bummed. And then we pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps and said, decided between each other, you know what? We're going to make this a very special holiday season. We're going to do it on our own. We're going to do it like the pioneers, you know, before you can travel and get back together with your families and it's struggling a bit. Yeah. And hopefully this is the only time in our lives where we have a COVID Christmas or a COVID Thanksgiving. You know, we want to remember it as being something really special. Right, right. So it's, it's just going to be the two of you. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. And okay. We're doing the whole spread. We, we're doing uh, the turkey. We're brining it. We got a special recipe. We've never done a turkey before. Wow. And uh, sure, the stuffing. Uh, she's making She's making two pies. I'm not even big on pies. She's making a pumpkin and an apple pie. Uh, stuffing. Uh, the whole nine yards. We're going to take pictures of the whole spread. She's got the table decorated. So Yes, yes, yes. So next time I'm going to share some pictures of our Thanksgiving. I encourage you to do the same. Yeah. Uh, Anne Marie's doing the same kind of thing. Uh, we've been, we've actually moved furniture around uh, to, uh, you know, accommodate her vision of Thanksgiving <clears throat> and it's coming together really well. And we've got all of the fix-ins. She's got a whole list of things that we're going to cook. I always cook the turkey. Oh, so you that's do. My, uh, that's my job. Yeah, I have this great Martha Stewart recipe. Uh, it's uh, it's some of the juiciest turkey that you'll ever have, I think, and uh, we're pretty happy with it. I've I've cooked, I've used that recipe, I think, about four or five years in a row now. Is, and every single time, it's a freaking home run. Oh wow! I I love the sounds <clears throat> of it. Can you like share a link with us? Uh, yeah, the show I notes? could actually. I I actually printed it out off of the internet, so I'll have to uh, transpose the. Hopefully, I can find the, the oh. link. But but yeah, it's a it's a good one, and it's it's one where you actually stuff the turkey while you're while you're cooking it with lemons. And oh oh yeah, I think that's pretty much what we're doing too. Oh, is that right? Oh, After it's... brining it, and we got this complicated recipe for the brine itself. which I've never done that before. That sounds I pretty interesting. I haven't either, but Lisa's like gourmet. She hates she is. that. She is. Yeah. Really, yeah, she is. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty exciting. So stuff, is, uh, stuff has started to cook already? No, well, yeah. What, what has she done? She's done two two pies now she's done both pies oh really brussels sprouts she she does these amazing roasted brussels sprouts i'd never liked a brussels sprout until i met her 
Yeah, yeah, if you prepare them the right way, boy, are they ever good. A lot of the trick to it is that she shucks or peels off so much of it. Literally, she only uses half of what she buys. Uh-huh. And then it roasted, just drizzled with some olive oil, salt, and pepper. I think that's it. But she's got our whole family hooked on them. She's obligated to bring her roasted Brussels sprouts to every family of us. I think I remember you telling me that yeah. before. So I bet those pies smelled pretty good in the house while they were cooking. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I'm not the biggest pie guy. I'd rather go back for seconds of the main course. and mm -hmm. forego ah, I'll, I'll always do a slice of it. Same here. I, I, this main course, I mean, I'm a big turkey guy. I love turkey. Yeah. I love mashed potatoes. I mean, if, oh. that, if that's all I had for Thanksgiving, I'd still be happy. I know, me too. And I got to say, I, I have perfected my nearly world famous garlic mashed potatoes recipe over decades really and it's healthy man it's it's yeah it's baked potatoes you know just uh boil them forever and you almost can't overdo them but you can underdo them um and then i saute a bunch of onions and garlic in a separate pan with olive oil Mm. Okay. And then uh, I think off the top. Okay. So some salt, of course. Right. And uh, when I put it all together with just 2% milk, no sour cream, no, nothing, uh, no butter. I've tried all those things figure, oh, it's the holidays. I'll go crazy with this stuff. It doesn't make it better. It definitely does. So I stick with my regular recipe and 2% milk. The trick is is that it has to be brought to a frothing boil. Oh. It has to be frothing, otherwise it messes with the texture. It's all Is that right? Yeah, so put it all together, whip it up, and uh, away you go, that's it. it. And it's creamy. Oh, and additional, as much olive oil as you need to make it so creamy, you almost don't want to put gravy on there. Wow, creamy mashed potatoes. There's yeah. nothing like it. Yeah, I you, love that. You know what else they're good with is when I do uh, my buffalo chicken strips. And oh. they're in all that hot sauce. And then you just take them out. You could do it with your hand and dip them through those mashed potatoes and eat them. Now, now hold on a second. Let me ask. <laughs> I'm going to take a side road here. Didn't you purchase one of those uh, air fryers yeah. for like the buffalo wings. Have you made yeah, that? We've How done. How is that? My it, mouth is terrific. Watering. Terrific. I know. <laughs> I is too. <laughs> it's absolutely terrific. The big surprise is when we did my brother's fish, uh, walleye, fresh walleye. Yeah. And Lisa breaded it and everything. And oh, came out really crispy, really good. It was as good as the, it was better than the fried stuff because you didn't have the somewhat of an oily. Mm -hmm. You always get a slight oil after so much of it. You get a little, okay, I'm sick of the oil. Um, yeah. So you still, it remains light. Uh, you know, I don't think we've done it with the chicken fingers. Yet. No, no. I, I thought that think was the first so. thing that you made. Maybe it was. I wish Lisa was here to comment on that. Uh, yeah, but yeah. what I was blown away with was the fish, because I thought that was a trick. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. We did what, a what's, lot of French fries. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, because, uh, you know, when you're cooking with oil, like it, it, it's messy. And I, I figure with an air fryer, what, what's that like? Well, uh, I will admit that you do, you should use at least a, a little bit of spray olive oil, just uh -huh. a, a little bit, or shake it in a bag or, or something. Just, just put a tiny bit. Prevent the of, sticking or? Uh, I think it helps with the crispness. Oh, I see. I got you. Yeah. So did I answer your question? I think so. <laughs> uh, is it is it messy though? Like I guess that's no, what I was getting. Not to. Re not really, not really. <laughs> and you know, I was just at the store and I saw a new air fryer because I heard the the limitation that we have with our air fryer is because we had a couple people over and we were frying some stuff up and with fries and so you're only doing one batch at a time. And everything takes about eight minutes. So oh. it's like, okay, what do you want next? Do you want the chicken fingers or whatever? Or do you want French fries? I see. So <clears> I so saw yeah. at the store today, there's a double decker air fryer. Double decker. How about that? That's the way to go. I'm telling you, that's the way to go. I think <laughs> those are, uh, I think they're a really good investment. Because I look at it like back in the day, 
I finally, finally got my foreman's grill. Do you remember that, George? Oh, food? yeah. <clears throat> I've had I, some food out of that before. It's pretty pretty good. Yeah, but it because it was working off of the uh, no-fat craze, low-fat craze. Right, right. I don't know, man. So I finally, finally got mine. I used it a few times, and it's still sitting in the basement. To this. I yeah. haven't used it in many, many years, and I, I'll never use it. Isn't that the problem with these kinds of things? This is why I don't have an air fryer because I said to Anne Marie, "Hey, Barry's got an air fryer and he loves it." Yeah. No, there's not going to be enough room. And I'm like, okay, and then Scott got one. My brother, yeah, I uh, got one. Uh, What's a his report? Weeks ago. He's oh, a good he's, cool. he's same thing. He was yeah. he was raving about it, and I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, well, Barry's got one and Scott's got one. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so I'm with you that I, I it takes up it takes up space. That was my my point. We keep we, it in the basement. Yeah, and, and we only the, bring it up when we need it because it is big, but right. it's worth it. That's See, that's I'm the saying. thing. You mentioned the the George Foreman, and it's like I have a a museum of different articles like that in my basement. You know, oh boy, there it is. Yeah. The, the old crock pot, there it is. <laughs> I haven't yeah. used that in a while. Although when we break it out, boy, it's it's worth everything, yeah. and they're cheap. But I mean, it's worth the storing space and all that kind of stuff. Because boy, does that ever make some good? Well, food, it's but... kind of like the exercise equipment. You know, I've been wanting that treadmill like forever, right. and it ends up being a very expensive clothes hanger in the basement. Right, right. It takes Everyone, up all that space, and right? very expensive. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. that's that's. I'm kind of the same way about kitchen appliances is I know people that just have every one of them under the sun, rarely use them. Uh, Lisa and I are anti-clutter. So it's, yeah. you know, they got to be important. You know? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Wow. So, so I wanted to just stress here because as I mentioned that we're going to go into these really dark months now and people, you know, COVID spiked more than I think anybody really expected. And I saw some headlines on California again. Um, oh yeah. And so I just want to encourage people and especially the, you know, there's uh, we got plenty of single older, single adults in our family make a plan. Okay. It may be one thing to get through Thanksgiving, but now you, you literally, you got Christmas coming up in, four weeks, New Year's on the heels of that. Think about what you, what you can do to make this a more productive. I don't want to find people, you may think, oh, well, I don't have that seasonal affective disorder that Barry's always talking about. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're going to be alone during these holidays or not, not doing the entertaining things that you normally would, you might find yourself into a slow declining depression. And I don't want, you know, those, you know, depressions on the rise, suicides on the rise. It's, I think it's going to be bad uh, as we get through this winter. So I just want to say, make a plan. And, and if you're single and you're not sure what to do, you might want to think about volunteering at the homeless shelters or something like that, where you're doing some good. And let me tell you, it makes you feel really good. Yeah. So have you had any other volunteer experiences since yesterday. the last time? Oh, yesterday. yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Were you back at the uh, Shaker Lakes? Uh-huh. The Nature Center. Nice. So I, I just did my, oh, about two, two and a half hour training session orientation to be the trail ambassador. That's a, <laughs> so I get familiar with frequently asked questions. And I mean, you don't know this because the nature, Shaker Lakes Nature Center has really been built up in the last 10 and 20 years. Right. And these uh, boardwalk like trails are going off. So uh, one and a quarter mile of them all around the marsh and everything else. I do remember boardwalk trails back then. They must have expanded them. But yes. I remember that being a really cool thing down there yeah i'd say they've doubled probably mm -hmm. in the 20 years uh, since you've been here and so i'm getting familiar with the frequently asked questions and that kind of thing and uh i i really like it so we also don't know how it's gonna go yet over winter because of covid and yeah yeah and they do not clear these trails these oh. boardwalk. uh so yeah, of course uh, but our winters have been so mild the last couple. So they just asked what my avail availability is like. We discussed that. And I said, you know, whatever works. And 
Uh, so I'm anxious to update you and see how that goes. But everybody involved with this is so nice, so kind. And, and people that even frequent or go to a nature center, uh, l- let me tell you, it weeds out a lot of the undesirable. So it's I so can fun. imagine. Yeah, yeah, people are going there because they, they want to relax. They, they want to enjoy nature. They're in that mode when you get there. So it's, uh, I bet that's uh, very pleasant, very pleasant. It is. Now, it- do you get to wear a badge? I do, and it's a, <laughs> it's a it's a badge that simply says "ask." I think it says "ask me," so okay. it just identifies me as someone oh, there else. There you go. I do think you got for, the authority. Uh, a little bit. I do think it would be well. I remember when she, uh, the head of the volunteer stuff, originally was interviewing me. I th- I may have told you this before. I remember, but I it's on a Zoom, it was on a Zoom meeting too, and she's so nice, Jen Moore. And I go, do I get a gun? <laughs> dead like, silent dead silence <laughs> like i'm just kidding just kidding can you hold for just a minute <laughs> but i really do think uh just a vest i mean you know everything's about a budget it's a right, shoestring right. budget so i th- do think just a vest that you put over your coat that has identifying colors would be good oh. Let me ask you this. So what, what's uh, I, Shaker Lakes? It's beautiful. What mm-hmm. do people come there? Like, is there a certain thing they come there to see? Or is there a special thing? You, you mentioned frequently asked questions. I yeah. wondered, you know, what, what is the, what's the attraction there that people are asking about? It's been built up around uh, children and bringing in busloads of children from all the local school districts and stuff. And they even had a, the whole second story edition that is classrooms and things like oh, wow. that. They have snakes and, and stuff in uh, habitats. And as far as outside goes with all those trails and everything in adults and stuff like that, it's, it seems to be a lot of bird watchers for the most mm, part. Mm-hmm, and just mm-hmm. a lot of people that want to get out and get some exercise and be outside. It's all walking, right? There's no cycling or anything like that. Around Correct. There. No dogs, no cycling. No but dogs. it's, wow. it's uh, right. Uh, because of disabilities it's disability friendly. Yeah. And uh, so, do- and dogs, uh, people don't clean up after their dogs the way they should. And if it's all about children being out there, then you got a health hazard. In a yep. Yep. And they built these really cool like stops uh, where they're uh, kind of classroom or. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 So the kids can I remember that when yeah. they do uh, all these different presentations. Yeah, it's really cool. It's, it's really cool. Uh, what did I want to? Oh, I wanted to mention that on Monday I did a special guest episode with Sandy Mobley. And she is a business coach and leadership coach. And she discusses stuff about really super important right now about find and it relates to us so well finding your career of passion, and she's got an MBA from Harvard, a bunch of other credentials. So she's the one that she's a real expert, and I think you'll all find it very fun and interesting, and maybe learn a lot. And she also shares some exercises to help you on earth you you know a lot of people just don't know what their real passion is you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we talk about it all the time it's it's one thing to work the grind for years and years and at some point though you're like man everybody says i should be you know embarking on what i'm really passionate but i don't know what i am passionate about a lot of people are in that boat so she shares some techniques it's nothing it's not much more than what you and I talk about from time to time, but I, she has a lot of experience with it. I think it's time well spent. It's a quality half hour. So check it out on over 50 starting over.com or our YouTube channel at, which is over 50 starting over as well. Boy, finding your passion and having somebody to help you to find your passion. What well, that's a, that's a big deal. I bet she's that's got some really good stories of people that have been set free from the doldrums of just, you know, having a job to going to something where they feel valued and they have a position in life. Yeah. And she shares a couple case studies as well, just right along the lines of what you're saying, just uh, some people that were, you know what, in two of those case studies that she was talking about. (laughs) It's kind of funny. The problem was they got promoted. 
So they, you know, that, that can be a big problem. That, yeah. She was talking about this one guy who was doing this stuff. He was actually placing seniors into the proper new housing and stuff like that for years. He loved it, got promoted. And now he's in this metrics kind of uh, position with, you know, a bunch more money and all that. And he hated it. Yeah. So a promotion I, I shared, it made me think I had the same experience when I was, you know, in my twenties coming out of college, I get my first job, a, uh, a design marketing firm. I rose in five years. I rose to uh, running the place as creative director. I was a manager. I became a manager. I was doing paperwork all day, managing uh, other designers and stuff like that. And I was, that's why I decided to go out on my own. Boy, that's, that's an interesting story. Yeah, being a manager isn't all it's all cracked up to be, that's for sure. And a lot of times it's a glorified babysitting job, depending on what you're doing. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. It was that aspect of it that I hated the worst, is uh, dealing with the personalities. It felt like a glorified uh, babysitting job, even though I was like 25, I was 27 when I left there and went on my own. So I was young, you know. Yeah, you but were. Yeah. I did have also the backup of I just went into teaching at a local college as well, teaching design. It's Sandy in that uh, interview also shared how she doesn't encourage people to just go take the leap. Yeah, have faith. No, she helps. She she talked about in these cases how she helped build a bridge for these people to reduce risk as much as possible. And so that's what I'm saying in my own experience, too, is I started teaching on the side. You got to, you know, it's important, like, if you're like me and you go out and do your own gig in the gig economy, that maybe you have more than one source of income. It's mm -hmm. a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Actually, we talked about that, I think, back in season one. But I think it's a very important thing to, uh, to fall back on. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah, go right ahead. So when you talk to people like Sandy, do you ever, I mean, you've been doing what you've been doing now ever since I've known you. I mean, you've, yeah. there's been different aspects of what you're doing, but you've been basically in the same kind of career. When you talk to Sandy, do you ever think, boy, I w maybe I should have done this or maybe, I mean, do you ever get any ideas like that where you think, I should have tried this or maybe I would have been great doing this or maybe mm. there's something you still long for. I, we've talked about certain things, but does anything come to mind? Wow, that's a great question. Are you doing your favorite thing that you could possibly do? And you know, I just thought about that for a while the other day and because I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to answer that question because I feel like I was always trying to do exactly what I should be doing. I've always been. Oh, that's that, good. An artist, uh, some, an art uh, spans a lot of different realms. Mm -hmm. For me, writing, creating content is a huge part of it. And it's something that I always think that I should have been doing. And I do. Uh, obviously, the design. I always wondered if I should have early on much earlier, went into music, but I had it. So when I, my first semester at Kent, yeah. I, took, I took introduction to music and this is part of exploring that. Right. And it was a bunch of, and, and my first semester was like a lot of people's first semester. I was out <laughs> partying and, <laughs> and I hated that class. I, I, and I failed introductory to math. I had to take that the same semester. I, I failed that I, introduction to music was a bunch of talking about cavemen beating on rocks. And it was a whole bunch of beating on class? rocks. I quit going. I just quit going. <laughs> And uh, so I totally messed up my first semester, but it was, I, you know, it, if I would have had a very positive experience with that introduction to music, I wonder if I would have followed it further. Aha. Uh -huh. And, uh, and what, what would you do with like, what play an instrument or what, what do you think? Different instruments. I remember yeah. I was, Oh, Did I you ever play anything? Guitar, bass yeah? guitar, messed huh. around with keyboards for a while. Wow. I did a jingle. I didn't know that. Your company, uh, way back. You uh, did? I don't remember. Yeah. This. What was you did the a name? jingle? 
communications company. Was it Evtech? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I did this animation. It had something to do with a bird. And then yeah, I yeah, just Alfie. Oh, yeah. And I did some stuff with the, on the keyboards uh, for background <clears throat> music. I barely I remember, remember that. that. Yeah. I barely remember it. Gosh, so, that is really something. I dabbled in everything, but I kind of wonder that, well, if I really was meant to be uh, to do music, then wouldn't I have just been doing it since I was a yo very young? Wouldn't I have just... I've what a great dabbled. question. Yeah. So, but I've always draw, you know, would draw and paint to a, a degree, but I always yeah. like drawing and I always like writing. And so that put me into design. I love the problem solving aspect of uh, design. There's a bit of philosophy to it. I love philosophy. So right, I kind of right. think that I've been in the right thing and to watch it evolve over the years, like my job, the, the way. It, I've had to deliver my this marketing stuff over the years has always been evolving and changing. So I kind of think that I'm always been doing what I should be doing. That's really cool. I, that, I wonder how normal that is. That's, that's probably know. very unusual when you, uh, when you find somebody that's been doing the thing that they've always wanted to do. But, uh, that's really pretty cool. But I got to say it's, I've spent many, many periods of this time doubting that uh, because it's always been so hard. Things have always changed so rapidly with technology and all that. I'm always thinking like, I've always been in fear of being running this, uh, chasing this runaway train and not being able to catch it. And uh, I kind of feel like I've been arriving at a place where technology has pardon me, kind of um automated enough that i can just i can concentrate more on implicating the marketing end of it the thought process the content those things that i do kind of enjoy and instead of uh, troubleshooting tech all day which when earlier in web design it was nothing but troubleshooting tech all the uh, time that sounds terrible I, uh, yeah it was terrible and i was yeah. and it got to be there was a period of time right before i started the o over 50 starting over concept because this is what led to a pretty much a, a brick wall hitting a brick wall is being uh, going down the road of web design and I hate being called a web designer because it's such a commodity. And at first it wasn't, it was, uh, Oh, Barry's that guy that with the design talent, that's tech savvy. And right. It, right. It really, that kind of defined me coming right out of shortly after coming out of college, I was the guy that learned how to use all this stuff, then started teaching college, teaching other people. How to, I, that's how I rose at the uh, design firm is right. I, I was the one that learned how to do all that stuff and then teach other people how uh -huh. to do it. Right. And so that's why I was asked to start te teaching classes at the local college. And uh, so that became uh, how I define myself, but boy, then it became my prison because sure, I had a nice niche doing web design when it, before many people knew how to do it. And the people that knew how, most of the people that knew how to do it more, more engineering kind of people that didn't know how to do the creative part well. Mm. And so I kind of bridged that gap a bit, but found myself as things evolved quickly over 10 years 15 years i found myself in this horrible role of being this commodity called a web designer where you're looked at all of a sudden people oh, i could i could uh ship that out to <laughs> india anybody could do this right yeah yeah and people misunderstood that and right. i and i really resented where i found myself and yeah. that's what took me to the crossroads of, I told, I, I told you this story before when all of a sudden uh, I was in this bad place. Then I get this text that my mother broke her back. And uh, so I had to go out there to my old home of Painesville for pretty much the summer on my own at a bad place in my life and figure myself out. 
and I spent my evenings uh, with the dogs and cat and stuff, yeah. really in a lot of quiet in, the, in most of the days, riding my bike through old neighborhoods of you know, uh, uh, figuring out my childhood and thinking the, about your past and your old yeah. neighborhoods and how ironic that the name of your town is Painesville. Yeah. Isn't it? And, uh, <laughs> going back to Painesville, I, I worked a lot out there and I started assembling a list of everything that I hated in my career and everything that I liked about it. And that's where I started a blog called over 50 starting over that uh, because I like the teaching aspect and um, I, I, I liked uh, helping people. And that's really what it was about. It was a major shift from simply doing design and marketing, but I could help people creating their own market, finding their own better self. And then when you and I started talking about it, this a little about, we really started talking about it close to two years ago, but we didn't know what we were going to call our podcast until after we got started. When I laid out the concept of over 50 starting over, you're like, that's perfect. It was natural. So that's the story on that. Oh, there's so much uh, other stuff um, that we can talk about. Well, that's pretty cool stuff. I mean, you know, just the other day I was, um, <clears throat> I was, I was filling out some paperwork for this, uh, I, you know, it's time to renew for insurance. And there was all the supplementary stuff that uh, where I could earn points that would reduce my spending for next year on my, my health insurance. And one of them was this goal setting class. And it's like a 45 minute online class that you take and you, you take it and somehow you can get a reduction in your insurance costs for the, the next year. And it asked me to list out some things that I would like to do in my life that I have apparently haven't done yet, or, you know, some things that I, I would like to put out there as goals. And so I started thinking about it. Well, what do I want to do? What else do I want to do? And I started thinking, well, I've always wanted to have a radio show. So, and you know what? I'd like to have it to be a talk show. And, you know, I'd like to talk about God. I'd like to talk about the government and politics and current events. Oh, my God, I'm already doing all of this stuff. <laughs> I was like, all right, I can check that off. That's pretty cool. That I mean, is very cool. Like the very first things I was thinking of, well, I'm already doing it. Right. Uh, that's, that's a good place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to talk, we, believe it or not, we've only got like a half hour to go and there's yeah. a whole bunch of stuff that I kind of want to talk about. Oh, let's go. There's a lot of good news. There's just, I just found this morning some new things in politics. I'm not even sure that you're aware of, but because you got a late start. And, yes, uh, I did. And right. I haven't been, haven't done anything this week except for oh. get ready for Thanksgiving. And all I'm trying to tell you is there's more here than we can cover. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in my notes, there's like, you know, a week or two ago, you and I were talking about the fine line between working and slavery. Yes. And it's related to what we we're just talking about, what we're always talking about, about finding your career of passion. And, you know, something that you get seduced by is uh, after you put in so many years into a company, into a career, especially if it's like government, I think Sandy was talking about that in the guest segment, uh, you <laughs> earning tenure somewhere, earning a pension, you got yourself into a nice, neat little pr prison at some point. It and could so, be. Yeah, yeah. What is the fine line between working versus slavery? Because even in uh, quote slave, conditions, you're still getting a lodging, food and lodging in exchange for labor. Right. And yeah. So, and if you're working for years and years, eight, 10 hours a day uh, for your food and lodging, still just making ends meet, really, you don't feel like you're in the lap of luxury or anything. What's really the difference? I, you you know what? Your, and, my, and you hate your job. See, that's the thing. It, it, it has to do with if you, if you hate your job. If you don't like your job and it's causing you to lose your health and if you get out of it, somehow there's going to be a gi gigantic penalty. It's, it is uh, a lot like 
So I, well, I like slavery. I mean, you're a slave to that particular job. Yeah, and I just want to make clear because I always say things without thinking about certain sensitive things, I think. And somebody could be screaming at this podcast going right now, it's freedom, you idiot. You still have choices when you're, well, but my point to that is, is feeling like you don't have a choice when you hate your job, but you got so far in it, you don't, you don't know how to Well, get- a great example of that is my father. I mean, he had been working for the Bell system for nearly 30 years uh, but when he passed away. And I think it was just over 30 years. And he had a few years more to get to his pension. And the job, he was at a, uh, when he passed away, he was a vice president of personnel at Ameritech. And so he had really climbed the corporate ladder in a Fortune 500 company. And he was now doing some pretty huge things, handling the labor negotiations with the labor union and everything. And you could see it was taking a terrible toll on him. His health was declining. He was aging very quickly. He had picked up a bunch of weight. He had high blood pressure. He was high risk. And he was, he was my age now where I am today. Right. And um, we had told him, Dad, you know, we, we, we we're concerned and we want you to think about retiring. And his quip was always, if I retire, I'm going to lose my pension. And so he stayed in the job and he finally, I've told the story a bunch of times, but that was the thing that kept him in there was losing his pension. It was the golden handcuffs that he had, that he could not leave that. And he finally decided to leave that and he would have left a lot of money on the table, but he finally decided, you know what? It's not worth it, but it was Mm -hmm. too late. It was too late to make that decision. We have a viewer in the show uh, Tim, actually viewers, Tim and Christina and Christina recently shared with me over a phone call that she had been listening to our show and what we'd been talking about, how, about how important family is, how important life is, and that we sometimes have to make decisions regarding our career that might hurt in the short term, <clears throat> might even hurt our ego in the short term, but in the long term, it's more about your family and the people that you love. And she's our age, and she's been working in a particular career for a long time. She decided to take a demotion just within the last couple of weeks, and it had everything to do with this philosophy. Her daughter uh, just has a, a, she's she's a new grandmother, and she's living in Oregon near her daughter and, uh, and the baby, she wants to be able to spend quality time with her family Good and not her. not have uh, this burden that's causing all this anxiety and taking away her energy and her quality of life. So and years that decision, and she is so happy that she made that decision based on the the stories that we've been sharing here. She's free. She's free wow. now. Think about that, Barry. What a great thing that we've been able to parlay to her. And I'm sure many others have considered the same kind of thing. But the fact is, is that when my father died, the way that he died so suddenly and didn't get to, as my aunt said, didn't get to smell the roses, I don't want, I I want my life to, to be in a place where I get to help other people to not experience that. Right. So that people don't miss their loved ones the way I miss my father. And we get to pay it, pay it back, pay it forward, Barry. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing that's come out of your dream as you were driving, riding around on your bicycle in your neighborhood in Painesville. Think, I bet it was hard to figure that somebody you don't even know would be freed by the contemplations that you were having those, all those years ago. Wow, that's... Um... That's really moving. Not even sure what, what to say to that. It, it's very moving. Also, uh, I am sure she's had plenty of other contributing factors to that as well. But I, I want to say just congratulations because I can't think of anything more important, more moving than to be able to share those years as a, as a grandmother with your family. You know, there's, and I've not had kids, but I do know from all of my friends who have become grandparents. That is the most rewarding thing in the world to go through raising kids, which is, oh, 
I just, the reason uh, we'd never had kids is just the sheer hell that we think it would be, you know, <laughs> but the reward, it's like being a grandparent is the reward because you get all the good parts without all the bad. Yeah, it's like being a parent without all of the work. Yeah. You know, as soon yeah. as it starts to get taxing, you're like, I'm a grandpa. Take this kid away from me. <laughs> so I think that's the best thing in the world. And I am hoping, as we always talk about, we talk about artificial intelligence and automation and the things that are coming in the, oh, I, I'd even say that the rise in consciousness that is happening in this society, I hope that more and more people will be able to truly enjoy their 50s, their 60s, and 70s in a very healthy and happy manner, more so than we, much more so than we used to in the past. Well, I think it comes back to, you know, exactly what we've been saying, what you were talking about with Sandy the other day. It's, it's finding your passion. Yeah. If you're going out there and you're just, you know, pounding the pavement every day and it is a drag it's it's gonna kill you mm -hmm. um boy i have been reading these two i just finished reading one book and almost done with another one one of them is called up from slavery by booker t washington and the other one is called uncle tom's cabin by uh um Oh boy! It'll Everyone knows Beecher Stowe, that. Harriet Beecher Stowe, right. and uh, I, I just became very interested in slavery, and it has a lot to do with. I mean, I've always been interested in it, but it has a lot to do with recently a lot of the things that are going on in our society right now. The politically correct movement. Mm. Um, there's sort of a bondage. Uh, the the COVID thing. There's a bondage that we're dealing with oh, here, yeah. right? That we oh, can yeah. all feel. And so, uh, reading these stories, it was interesting. Just two examples: the Booker T. Washington, a very prominent black man, a former slave. He 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 gets out of slavery as a teenager, and he ends up becoming the person who founds Tuskegee Institute in um, Alabama, which is still a thriving college today. And never made excuses about slavery, uh, about uh, what he was into. And now that he was free, he could give back to the community at large. And he didn't see his, his, his situation being a situation where white people against black people or black people against white people. He saw it as love everyone. The white people were just as much victims of slavery as black people. That's what he said. Wow. Uh, it actually, he, this is a former slave. He could see how it degraded them. It depraved their minds. It caused them to, uh, you know how you and I always talk about when you treat other people poorly, it's like you're giving yourself a black eye. Yeah. He could see that. Wow. He could see how it damaged them. Uh, internally, it, it, it destroyed them. And, and when the Civil War was over, the whole South was broken, white people and black people. And he saw an opportunity to work with white people, former slave owners, uh, to educate black people so that the whole South could rise together. A beautiful sentiment uh, and, and a way of getting out of slavery, like you said, helping other people. You always talk about that, mm. just like that, that buoys you up to the top. Well, the second one, the Uncle Tom one, you know how we've been hearing about Uncle Tom and people being called Uncle Tom? Well, yeah. come to find out in the actual book where Uncle Tom is, he's the exact opposite of what society calls Uncle Tom. This is the most solid man you'd ever want to meet. He's a, a self-sacrificing, powerful man of faith. And he doesn't take any crap from anybody. But at the same time, he's a loyal individual that is, he's the kind of friend that you would want in a pinch when you're in a bad situation. He's mm -hmm. like a solid guy. But the whole thing is, you know, he, the, where I am in the book right now, he's in a cotton uh, plantation and these poor people are just beaten down doing a terrible thing that just takes all of their energy no there's no mind satisfaction here they're stealing all of the the juice out of your life and this guy all he has left is his faith to rely on um, and I just relate that back to this whole mentality of slavery and the workforce and everything and you know 
the difference is that if you're in that situation today, unlike what my father believed, he could have gotten out of those golden handcuffs. He could have freed himself. It was an illusion that he was trapped into this whole thing and he could have freed himself and gotten out of that and moved on to something that was his passion. And his passion was actually helping other people. Mm. Let that be a lesson to everybody today. Let his life be an, a lesson to everybody today. Let Uncle Tom's life be a lesson to everyone today. And Booker T. Washington, that it's that love overcomes all of this. And love has to do with helping other people. And when you help other people, man, glory happens. And the money will come. And I love, just final thought, what you're doing at Shaker Lakes is exactly that helping other people. And that sunshine that you're emitting is bouncing back and reflecting back on you and it's causing you to shine. It's a pretty fantastic thing you got going on there. Oh, that's a, that's a beautiful way to put it. And on the other hand is I've also heard the stories. I took a, a class in college. Um, it was one day a week, three hours on the Holocaust taught Ooh. by a Jew. <laughs> and he that, was that was fascinating oh uh, every single class is just choking back tears yes it was fascinating but of course i've heard all the terrific stories too about some of these prisoners and it's horror the horrors um are beyond description but uh some of these prisoners would couldn't be broken that they would still find through faith their love and they could still maintain a degree of happiness and, um, oh, what, what would be the word? The, the, their own sense of self. They, they just absolutely couldn't be broken as through their own faith. You know what's interesting about that? In this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the thing that the slave master is trying to do is break Tom's faith. Yeah. Because if he can break his faith, then he can control Tom. He's he, at the point where I left off in the book, he's the slave master is trying to turn Tom into an overseer and he tries to get him to whip this woman that he actually had helped. Mm. And uh, he won't do it because of his faith. And then he gets the crap beat out of him until he's unconscious. And they're just going to, they're going to, but they know, they know he's a Christian. So they're, they're trying to get him to doubt his faith. And, and that's the thing that you see time and time again in history is it's the people of faith that won't be broken for what's right and for what's wrong. Boy, there's an analogy that's going on here. Um, I see there is an attack on faith that's happening worldwide. I mean, it's just how it is. There's a good versus evil thing that's happened here, but there's a reason why there's an attack on faith. If, if evil can't, can get God out of the way or faith out of the way, then it triumphs. And um, when you see an attack on faith, that should always be a red flag. There's a there's a, a a purpose for this whole thing, and we're seeing it around us today too. Um, is red flag. That's all I got to say about that. Well, you know, this is related in a way. Is the, I just saw this headline an hour ago or so. Penguin Random House staffers broke down in tears over release of George. This is a terrible headline, um, but there is a different headline on. Fox. No, that was Fox uh, in a different publication. Um, here's the gist. is Jordan Peterson is putting out a new book, and the staffers at Penguin Random House are protesting against it because they call him a white supremacist, and mm -hmm. he's against uh, trans people, and yeah. he's not either of those. They, they know just enough to be dangerous, and it's just a typical censorship movement. And, but it's right back to uh, what, you know, he always preaches faith in his own way, in his own yeah, gentle he does. ways. And yes, he, uh, he is sort of a conservative. He calls himself a classical British li uh, liberal. But today, that is so threatening to the progressive uh, left. And so they're trying to censor uh, the book. They're trying to prevent... Penguin Random House from even publishing the book, then they want to uh, cancel or shame people out from carrying the book. This is just, I can't. It's, it's crazy. 
it's, it's crazy. crazy. It's crazy yeah. what's happening in the publishing industry right now. I, we talk a lot about what's happening with online media, but what's yeah. happening in publishing right now is a consolidation of these publishing houses. For the most part, Amazon controls 99% of publishing these days. And if they don't publish it, it's going to be tough for you to get your book published. And we're going right back to the days of book burning right now, which mm. is exactly what you're talking about. To Kill a Mockingbird is the latest book on their, really? in their sites right now. I don't know if you read that when you were a kid Probably. or not. I was, I was made to read it, but it was actually a very good book and it had to do with racism and there's uh, some racism racist rhetoric that's in there, much like in the Uncle Tom book that I'm reading. But if there's any hint of that going in there, and by the way, when you get to the end of the story, there is a good message that, that comes out of that book, and there's a faith message that comes out of that book. These are all books in the crosshairs of the progressives. And I think it's also interesting when you talk about a liberal, a classic liberal like Jordan Peterson being attacked by the left. And we're seeing this happen. Remember, my definition of the left is that the left is not a liberal. The left is actually progressivism, socialism, communism. Mm -hmm. That's the left. Liberals don't are not on the left. They're on the left of the political spectrum, but they're not leftists. And they have very little in common with people on the left. Um, recently, John Cleese, uh, the guy from Monty Pythons has been on, he's been attacked. He's a liberal, uh, but he had some things to say about this whole thing about men who identify as women running in sports against actual women and had and was saying that he was against it. Now everyone's attacking him as a transgender phobic person. Mm. And so it's, it's the left eating the liberals is what mm. I'm seeing is that they can't have that liberal thought. It's going to be very interesting under a Joe Biden administration because he tries to say that he's uh, a centrist, but the people that are controlling him are anything but centrist. They're leftists. So Which we're going to see some interesting things here coming up. Go ahead. Brings me to the next headline. You're going to love this. It's just, it talks right, right to what you just said about Biden. And everybody said that Biden's going to change his tune as soon as he gets elected because he had to kiss up to the left, right? He really did. Here's another headline. I just saw an hour ago. Biden says he won't have Bernie or Elizabeth Warren in his cabinet because, in quotes, he needs them in the Senate in a major blow to the left's hope of landing key roles for their biggest stars. Ooh. <laughs> 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 who, who didn't see that lucid color? thought there? <laughs> right, yeah. right. Well, he, he actually does need them in the Senate, too, because of what's happening in the Senate. You, and he's probably counting on a win in, in Georgia with the, the Senate race, which would give them a majority in the Senate. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think that's what he's talking about and why, we, why he wants them in there. There's going to be some really interesting stuff because of the Black Lives Matter people, Patrice Cullors, mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, they wrote a letter to Joe Biden saying, oh, well, the reason that you're in there is because we black people voted you in. You wouldn't have gotten in. Now you owe us some things. Wow. And one of them is you're going to defund the police. And so, uh, oh, by the way, Patrice Cullors just got a contract with Warner Brothers, and uh, it's the first of its kind. She's going to be creating content for Warner Brothers in movies and ch kids, mm -hmm. kids uh, shows as well. And so we're going to see a lot of, um, well, I would call it... Uh, um, you know, communist. It, it, yes, I would say that. I mean, they're self-professed Marxists, mm -hmm. but I would say that we're going to see a lot of propaganda in yeah. uh, a lot more propaganda because we're seeing a lot of it right now. Right. But, you know, these people are, are, have been beaten into submission by that group. Uh, if they, if you go against that group, then you're labeled a bigot and that's very powerful today. And so they're going to do the same thing with Joe Biden and this new administration. And they're going to, we're going to see what happens. We're going to see what kind of strength this, this, uh, new administration has. And we still don't have closure on what's happened with the, with the vote, um, I think the Trump administration is losing some hope here. There's been some weird things that have happened over the last week. But 
there's still this constitutional uh, issue revolving around the Twelfth Amendment. As uh, if you read the Twelfth Amendment, what you'll find is that if the contest is still contested right before the inauguration, which is January 20th, then the actual Congress will vote on who the next president is going to be. And there's some pretty interesting twists in that. One of them, and I've mentioned this before, is that each representative doesn't get a vote. Each state gets a vote. And 37 out of the 50 states are majority Republican. So this could turn out to be interesting. It's, it's going to be interesting what happens here. Um, I, I think that if it turns out that way, people are going to be shocked, uh, especially because the media is not covering it. Hmm. It brings me to something I wanted to ask you for a while. And I know it's not directly related to what you just said, but I've been wondering forever and I read this. It still doesn't totally make sense. I keep hearing about the. I'm not even sure how to say it. Keep hearing about the QAnon, a, oh, a far yeah. right conspiracy theory is what yeah. I saw. Could you explain to me what this is that I'm all of a sudden hearing about all the time? But I don't know they, a lot about it, Barry. It's been in the news for years now. It has a lot to do with uh, what was the guy Epstein that was killed and, and oh. some of the stuff around him and just these these. It's it's pretty disgusting. I, I don't. It's one of those things where. Uh, you've got people that are involved in uh, sex slavery. You've got some, some which is huge. type of demon worshiping that's going on around that, where they're uh, having these rituals and eating certain disgusting things that uh, are part of the ritual. I don't know all of the uh, context around it, but this has been laid at the feet of the Clintons and many people around the Clintons. Um, I don't have much more detail than that. However, I would say this, that anytime I hear conspiracy theory, I, a, a red flag comes up in my head because I know that the term conspiracy theory was made up by the CIA in order to debunk theories that could somehow incriminate the CIA themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you go on the news and you just say, all oh, these far right organizations with their with this particular conspiracy theory theory immediately that debunks that whole whatever the th so called theory was mm -hmm. in the minds of the masses and it marginalizes the people that actually believe in that. So I always when I, when somebody says when the mainstream media is calling it a conspiracy conspiracy theory to me it's. Uh, well, it may, it may or may not be a conspiracy theory. It, it, we're living in a like day it. where it's, you don't know what to believe anymore. It, if you look at multiple sources and then try to cobble together some truth there, you know, the truth has a ring to it. We always talk about this. The truth has a ring to it. We're adults. We live in a nation where we're adults. The freedom of the press means people can say what they want, and it's up to us. It's incumbent on us to decide what the actual truth is, and we're supposed to be responsible enough to, act, to hear the ring of truth in these things. That's why we're so against censorship. Uh, I got to tell you, along those lines, uh, conspiracy theories and stuff, I just watched, just came out on Amazon Prime. You have it. Stephen Greer's Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. What is that? It's a documentary. And Dr. Stephen Greer was uh, an ER doctor. Right. And I forget how he got pulled into the whole UFO thing, but he did in a big way. Well, he first, he, he encountered one or something like that when he was like 17 or something. But a UFO? He, yeah. And... Okay. You got to see this documentary because there's a lot of information there that I can't summarize without sounding crazy. Uh, <laughs> you were already on the border. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have researched uh, Dr. Greer upside down and sideways because I'm, I'm always a skeptic. Fascinated and, though, too. Yeah. And, oh, and he actually was on Joe Rogan's podcast in like 2013 or something. So I'm in about the middle of listening to that. He covers a lot of the same ground. It's fascinating, but all, I mean, he's so connected in the government and so many uh, high ranking officials have called on him and 
we'll back them up and we'll tell their own experiences. Like what we don't, what we still don't accept is that the UFO phenomenon has been legit, legitimized by the government. To this yeah, it's, it's a pretty big deal. But they did such a great job at the conspiracy theory thing. <laughs> yeah, that, they did. <laughs> that unless, see, even you, you were like, a second ago, you were like, yeah, you are sounding a little crazy right there because we're conditioned to that. They, they messed us up with the whole conspiracy yeah. theory thing, right? Right. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you now because I maybe next week or whatever we can talk about this, but it also occurred to me that we got to get back on your constitution series that's why i was talking about the 12th amendment okay oh okay well, let's keep it in a nice uh tight-knit little thing because i would like to uh splice them out and put yeah. them all in one in one video eventually we, we will it, it, this okay. was a little bit of a uh off the cuff show today okay Oh, it certainly was. Yeah, because we had a discrepancy, which by the way, I got a lot more to hear. But um, by the way, I wanted to ask you, we vaguely talked about, so do we want to go to Wednesday mornings regularly? And yeah, we, that's, I don't think we've decided on that, but uh, I'm open to it, definitely. Yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards it myself. I think it's a better slot for our audience. Yeah. Yeah, Could be. yeah. Okay, did you see by chance the video this week of this guy that chases down an alligator that took his puppy? No, but and I he would pried him out of his mouth. He saved the puppy. I would beat the hell out of an <laughs> alligator that took my puppy. You know what? It would. There, there's no alligator that could scare me if it took my my dog. He, I, I'm going in with my dog. Yeah, he. This alligator snatched the puppy and went back into the pond. And this guy went. And Lisa's laughing to me after. Um, she's like, "You see this guy? He's got a cigar hanging out of his mouth." And he goes running. He goes, "That would be you." And I'm like, "You can't." Like, <laughs> well, first of all, he wasn't a big alligator. It was a small alligator. So I, <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't matter really, right? A small alligator. <laughs> like, go, hey Barry, go pet that small alligator over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, if it took my dog, yeah, I, I don't want to sit here and talk. Can you imagine stomping on that thing <laughs> to, to get to get my dog out of your mouth? <laughs> he, well, he saw it, and what I read, it, his hands were very lacerated because they oh, had sharp yeah. teeth. The yeah. dog had a puncture wound, but got out of there got out of there so i thought and i have a link to the video so anybody that hasn't seen it that's uh, wild no i didn't see that but that is I, yeah that's classic i love that it. is now yeah. i got three restaurant stories oh okay. okay yeah which restaurants have been oh geez just in my heart here during this COVID thing yeah me too so you do you know Nighttown in cleveland heights no Oh, it's, it's legendary here. Um, it's a jazz night, not a, I don't want to say nightclub, dinner place. I mean, they do amazing dinners and they uh, do live jazz and stuff like that. Well, they just announced that they're voluntarily closing down for a while because of COVID. Oh. And on one of the last nights, so this is just a couple nights ago, man, this was, uh, I saw this on Today, the, the Today Show. Man leaves a three thousand dollar tip ah. for a beer. He had one beer as the restaurant closes due to COVID nineteen. The owner said that the man wished uh, wished him well and told him to share the tip with the four other employees who were working the brunch service. Got wow. a link to that as well. Did not get the That's guy's huge. name. Yeah. You know how huge that is. The guy didn't want his name divulged. That's a true act of kindness. Is Amen. when you don't. You want, yeah, uh, you, you're, you're not looking for recognition for it, yep. just really for the purity of it. So I love that. Now in DC, a DC restaurant that feeds the homeless, uh, that also feeds homeless people, was about to close until donations poured in. Uh, they did a GoFundMe page as a last resort. Owner Kazi, Kazi Manan, uh, said that his restaurant was financially underwater due to the difficulties with the pandemic. Uh, anyways, I have a list of this whole story, but this is a guy that came from, I think it's Pakistan in something like 2016, not that long ago. 
And he comes here and he opens up a successful restaurant in DC. I'm just, and this is me putting this story together. Like, right, first right. of all, the guts that it took for this guy to do all this. Sure. You know, to come to a foreign country and open right. up a successful, uh, 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 a high end restaurant in DC, which is already so expensive anyway, and still decide to, with uh, his profits and everything, to feed the homeless this whole time, those in need, I just think is amazing. So anyways, they put together a GoFundMe page. He was looking for $250,000 that would be able, in his estimation, to pay the back bills and give them enough to continue on. And he, they're at $300,000. So I just think that's a great example of goodwill propagating goodwill. And I think it's I think an amazing so too. Story. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, my final restaurant story. We got links to all of these. Okay, a restaurant is using a Ferris wheel to allow diners to eat while socially distanced. <laughs> That's cool. It is Where very is this? cool. Uh, this is in Hung it's a Hungarian restaurant okay. called Costas. Uh -huh. And I have pictures of it and uh, I have the link here. I'll probably put the pictures over top of this. And um, the, these Ferris wheel booths, they're booths. They're not like what we remember as a kid, you know, hey, you up there. Oh my God, I'm terrified. I don't even think I'd be scared in this at all because they're enclosed. They look like dining cars. I don't know. Oh, wow. like, That's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, they partnered up with this Ferris wheel and are serving. Can you imagine that it just stops? You serve. It's a four course meal for it's about one hundred and fifteen hundred fifty five dollars for this yeah. uh, Michelin starred Hungarian restaurant. So this is I just think it's an um, a yet another amazing, innovative way of some that people. is very creative. That is very, very creative. I really like that. And especially now when you, you're hearing such depressing news about restaurants. You know, one of my favorite things, Barry, is to go out to a restaurant. I love that. Most and, people. Yeah. You know, it's it, out here. We just, just today, uh, our restaurants now, uh, you they are closed to only take out so we were having it where people could be outside uh you know these restaurants have been very creative in causing or making their floors outside so people can eat there and now they've 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 made that they've taken that away for the next three weeks only take out that's going to be devastating to these poor restaurants that are just mm -hmm. trying to keep their heads above water and we know that these places only operate on the thinnest of margins, but yeah, yes. for the next three weeks, they're done. So I think um, much like the person from Pakistan that you were talking about, uh, that it's important for us to still patronize these places. The ones that you yeah. like, the ones that have done a good job, keep buying from them. Uh, you'll just have to take it home, but and they'll be in business when uh, these things start opening up again. And I think it's also important to, Try to stick with your locally owned, your mom yeah. and pop shop. So it doesn't yeah. go into a corporate, get dispersed into uh, amongst corporate executives. Well, the fact is, though, is a lot of these are franchises like this yeah. Denny's right down the street from me. It, yeah, it's corporate, but it's a franchise. So it's, it's locally owned. Uh, yeah. And they've got local people that are working there and everything that depend on that whole place. It's, it's so we've been, that's the place I've been frequenting is that's, that's my place. I want to keep it going. And, you know, for Denny's, you look in Yelp, they've got five stars. You uh, have you, talked about this Denny's a lot. It, it, well, it's the closest place to me and I see yeah. what's happening with restaurants and uh, it's, it's sort of my litmus test of what's happening with restaurants out there. But, uh, but yeah, we're here in, in Los Angeles. We're under curfew now uh, between 10 and I six see. is the curfew. And if you travel to Los Angeles right now, you've got to fill out paperwork that says that you're complying with quarantining for 14 days um, so you get here and you got a quarantine for 14 days before you can go and do anything. Why would you, who would do that? I mean, no. <laughs> that seems crazy. What, what world are we living in here? This is insane. 
It's it's kind of like they should just take the highways going in and out of L.A. and turn them into just one ways because they're just going out, right? Y- yeah. You know what? That's actually a pretty good uh, picture in my mind you just created. Well, I heard in Washington, D.C., Mayor Bowser out there. I always remember her name because of your dog. <laughs> but um, she's made it so that the police are going to be tonight. They're going to be looking at favorite hot spots for college kids. You know how when you come home from college, there's always that one bar that everybody meets at. And, oh, I haven't seen you for years. Yeah. Well, they're going to be cracking down on those places in oh. Washington, D.C. tonight. And make sure those college kids don't have fun and then bring home COVID to their folks. Oh, it's a double-edged sword. I don't know what to say about that. I mean, I look at the charts all the time and the cases are spiking. My family is getting it. Uh, My football team is getting it. And um, just all I can say is the deaths are not, uh, you know, it's... Yeah, it's it's something like a 99 point some high number that of survival rate now which is great news uh but uh you know we still have these things that are i I don't know that these types of uh these laws are actually slowing it down i i just don't know that i don't think think anybody knows that i don't i don't know either i just can't uh can't wait for those vaccines to start getting out there as we wind up and uh, and we should I just want to say, I want to remind you guys, please take your holiday plans seriously. Make make a plan where you keep it positive. If it's Zooming with your family, and maybe you've never done that before, it could be fun and you can open up a whole new avenue so that you don't feel so separate. It's Zooming is a lot more fun than a simple phone call. So maybe give that a thought. If you're at home alone, by you live by yourself, you know, Give it some thought. You got a whole nother month of uh, plus of holidays to get through. And maybe you help some people with some volunteer. Uh, I'm not sure, but do something creative. I'd love, you know, we'd love to hear about it, whatever your thoughts are. Well, one of the things that we've talked about a lot, Barry, is that in order to maintain happiness, thanks, thankfulness is the, a key, um, maybe and even the biggest are. key. And here, like you said, here we are at Thanksgiving time. We've got a lot of things that are going on that are, that are negative. We can't hide from that. Right. There is more positive than negative going on. There just is. And I think like we, just, what? You, uh, we need to be focused on what we're thankful about. And I'll tell you one thing I'm thankful about this year is I'm thankful for the friends that I have. Uh-huh. Um, my, uh, my dad used to tell me this is that, uh, you know, how many friends do you have? I had like hundreds of friends, you know, when I was in high school. And he says, here's, here's something for you. You'll be able to count your true friends on one hand when you get to be my age, because those are your real friends. Do you think those are all your friends now? They're not. <laughs> as soon as high school is over, they're going to split. Yeah. And he, unfortunately, he was right about that. But right. Barry, you have been my very good friend and one of my best friends in life. You are a true blue friend. And there have been so many blessings that I've been able to get just because you and I are friends, this show being one of them. Sure. I'm thankful for you this year. Oh, I'm so thankful for you as well. I got to give a special shout out to Lisa because during this uh, you're time, one up in me, huh? Okay. Uh, come on. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm changing my name, Marie, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you covered the whole gamut there because you're yeah. absolutely right about how many friends you're going to have later on. I mean, you're absolutely right. And yeah, you covered all that ground. But Lisa is the one, she is the one that gave me the news that we weren't having Thanksgiving. And then she's also the one that said, we're going to march on and we're going to make this special. And I was right on. And because I was like, (laughs) immediately I'm going, oh, this means the entire holidays are wiped out. And I'm me and my seasonal affective disorder. Right, right. She's rescuing it single handedly like Wonder Woman. Um, But my garlic mashed potatoes stand on their own. So (laughs) my nearly world famous garlic. Oh, by the way. Um, share this with you. Um, oh no, my, I lost the, a razor blade around here somewhere. Oh, that's not good. Yeah. So I got this, uh, 
this on Amazon Prime just now today. And uh, be careful there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, because this has almost become co star on the show. What do we got here? <laughs> a new wow it's a new backup Christmas. mug yeah okay so i know a lot most of you actually listen to the podcast rather than see it. i am always armed with my one mug that i've been using this one mug for two years plus three more, closer to three and i always it lasts about six months to maybe a year somewhere in there uh just after our last podcast last week the bottom just broke off inside of this plastic sleeve. So anyways, Kidding I love me. this so much <laughs> because it's, it's not plastic. It's real glass. So you're not uh -huh. drinking plastic. It, it's microwavable and, uh, uh -huh. and it's insulated. So uh -huh. it's everything that I want in a mug. And uh, so, yeah, it just broke off. It didn't make a mess or anything, but I pull out my backup off the top of the shelf and then I order my other backup because I can't be without it. You know? Yeah, That's yeah. What Look I'm at saying. You. Always have a backup. Always. Right on. Right on. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I know. That was exciting, wasn't that it? That was exciting. <laughs> and I want to go back to what you were saying before and say thank you to Lisa for doing everything that she does here yeah. to, uh, to help you through this, uh, this holiday season. Wouldn't know what to do without her. Right? Yeah. All right, Merle. Uh, I want to just say happy Thanksgiving. I want to remind you to get on Amazon Prime and check out that... Uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind with Stephen Greer. I still am curious what the fifth kind, if third kind is that they, that you're having face to face and like, what could fifth, I don't, I'm, if I, I recall, shudder to think what fifth means. If I recall the, cause it, isn't it the movie, the original movie, the fourth kind? I think I it thought is. it was the third kind. Close okay. It's probably the, the, okay. You're I, two levels above this, but it sounds, I don't know. It sounds intimate. But it's something like, okay, the third or fourth kind is when they reach out and they show themselves to you. The fifth I see. kind is when you seek them out. Oh, oh, I see. I thought it was we we're cohabitating at that point. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife. No, it's not. Xenia. All right. Uh, hey, love you guys. Go to over50startingover.com over and sign up to get this dropped into your email box as it happens. Merle. Talk to you next week, Friday Happy or Thanksgiving. Wednesday. Happy Thanksgiving. Love you guys.